Bob the Builder, can we fix it? Bob the Builder, yes we can. Scoop Muck and Dizzy and Rolly too. Lofty and Wendy join the crew. Bob and the gang have so much fun. Working together, they get the job done. Bob the Builder, can we <laughs> fix it? Bob the Builder, yes, we can. <laughs> love it. I love <laughs> it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coralie. That was amazing. That was great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Welcome. That Welcome to the show. I, I know it was great that you got, you, got, uh, you got a hold of me because I totally forgot about it. We got into the groove of doing the shows, and all of a sudden you noticed that we were doing Zoom shows, and here we are. Here we are. This is amazing. So we've got a lot to talk about. Um, I want to, like, basically we're going to discuss... Uh, women in construction and technology and coaching, business coaching, consulting. We're going to touch a bunch of things. Uh, you're out in BC, right? I am, yes. Okay, cool. So uh, I just want to do a quick shout out to Fencor. I'm wearing his polo shirt today. And uh, this is actually probably the very first polo shirt I've ever worn in my life. And Angelina made a little fun of me, like I look a little odd in a polo shirt, but I'm in a polo shirt, so I'm just letting everybody know that. But shout out to Fencor, good guys, great builders out here in, in Ontario, so all good. Um, so where do you, I want to, okay, so Carly, I want to just let everybody know Thrive HQ is the business. How long have you been working at Thrive HQ? Um, two and a half years. Okay, and then it's www.thrivehq.ca, and it's Coralie at thrivehq.ca, and it's uh, on social. You, you're all over social media on IG at Coralie Beatty, and LinkedIn and Facebook, and then your business coaching consultant. Uh, what other titles you have going on? I also do fractional um, COO, and I, I'm a speaker and a trainer. I go in house and do training, so a bunch of different things. You're busy. You're very, very busy doing good things all over. I love what I do. Oh, cool. All right. So, where do you want to begin this conversation? That's a great question. Um, you know, we can start at the beginning. Yes. Actually, you know what? I'd like to, the bone to pick. That's where I want to start. Oh, please do, please. Okay. Because the bone that I have to pick is one that I'm really passionate about and kind of is almost like the foundation of everything I do, which is poor employers in the construction industry. I, I'm as when I was an employer, I did everything because I knew my people were my number one asset and I treated them like that. And I, I always put my people over the profit. And I think that in the construction industry, we have a really bad reputation of putting profits over the people. And we can't do that anymore. So that's my bone to pick. I think as employers, we need to step it up and take care of our people if we want to attract more people into the industry. We need to change that reputation. Do you feel, Corley, that um, most contractors do it because it's almost like a, a fallback where they realize I'm not making money in my business, so I'm going to ignore the most valuable component of my business? which is really the worst thing you can do. Is that what you think the majority of business owners in this industry do? I don't think it's necessarily intentional. I no, think no. it's more so, I think they don't really know. It's just the way things have always been done. Like from, you know, I've, I don't know how many times I've heard that, you know, it's the way we've always done things. And I think it's just from the beginning of time when people were grateful to have a job and showed up at work and it's a male dominated space and men aren't known to be emotionally, you know, connected on the job <laughs> site. So I think that those are things that have just never been part of the construction industry. So I think that it's just something that we're not used to in the industry. And I think with education and awareness, I think a lot more owners would be open to it. So I don't think that it's necessarily, I have to put my people second. Yeah. I think it's more so I didn't realize. I will say that, and I agree with you 100%. That's how us men in the industry, and I'm only speaking for myself and, and what I've seen uh, around my circle, but I, I think that there is a, a large portion of new talent that's coming into the industry that's at least identifying this. They're, they, mm -hmm. they, they may not necessarily be changing it or stopping it, but they're identifying it and they're possibly having conversations. I know here on the show, we've had a number of conversations about this and I've seen a number of tradespeople actually bring it up. They bring it up before I bring it up. And I'm like, I thank them. I always thank them for bringing it up because the, the first thing we can do is at least discuss it. It's very mm -hmm. important to discuss it. And then we can start trying to figure out how to change it. 
Yeah, awareness is key. And I think that that's where, um, you know, as long as we keep having the conversations and, you know, because even I think a lot of the young people that are coming up that sort of want these things, they necessarily they don't necessarily know how to voice it or to talk about it. So I think when we just have the conversations, then everybody's a little bit more open to it. And yeah, awareness, I think, is definitely cool. key. All right. So now, how did you begin Thrive? What was the what what happened that made you think I need to start this? Well, you know, it was it was a journey and I'll take a long story and make it relatively short. No, make it as long um, as you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we we had a trades business for 15 years. Okay. Uh, my husband was a is a plumber by trade and we had mechanical contracting company. We had that for 15 years and in the beginning, it was really easy. Like life was easy. There was work and money was there and it was rolling and it was like, well, we we're good at this. Like I was, you know, I was like a master organizer. I could do business stuff. Um, my background was also construction. So, you know, it was very easy for us to do. But after we started growing and adding employees, all of a sudden there was just this level that we could no longer, you know, keep the balls in the air. It's like, oh, you know, you kind of um, start to drop things. And we probably were like maybe eight to 10 employees at the point at which we were kind of going a little bit crazy. And I didn't even know back in those days that business coaching existed. And when we hired our first business coach, it was like this, I cried because it was like this huge relief. It was a huge, the biggest investment that we made in ourselves or our business at the time. And we knew we had to do it. And it was like this suffocating feeling of we have to, but how are we going to make it happen? But we committed to it. And it was like a game, it was a game changer for us. Like it was, it was the beginning of actually creating a business as opposed to just a job that controlled our lives. Was it so, a new language, Carly? What's you? that? Was it a new language to you? Like, were you intimidated <laughs> by this whole, like, I, um, can, I can assume it was. Not so much because my, my original career in the construction industry was with an, with a, uh, engineering firm and it was quite corporate. Okay. So I was at least, I, I understood what a good business looked like, um, but I didn't know the runnings behind. So the biggest thing for me was the finances, like learning how to actually create a proper chart of accounts and actually tracking your, our money properly and really, you know, being able to collect useful data. So that was probably the biggest eye opener for me. And it was just like, Oh, this is how it's done. Okay. So that was, probably it. And I mean, as far as a lot of the other business components, I think we had some of those things in place, but the clarity, like just really getting clear on what we did, who we did it for, why we did it, as opposed to just flying by the seat of our pants, which a lot of people do. So anyway, got that. And then we put ourselves in a position to sell our business. And um, that happened just about five years ago. And after that, like, I was just like, I knew I could do anything afterwards. I was like, I could do anything. And going into business with my husband was not going to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to so ask, was, you, like, was it difficult to let go of the business? Yes, like a lot more difficult after six months, probably. Like after the initial um, like honeymoon kind of phase, like, ooh, you know, we got this freedom. Um, it became really difficult. Okay. It Like there were some dark days, like while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, but also just because it consumed us for so many years, your identity becomes that. And yeah. now I don't have that. And so it was very difficult because it's me figuring out what I'm going to do. Who am I? Like I, I have four kids that I homeschooled. I was a wife. My husband, you know, started his next business pretty much right away, which was design and consultation for mechanical systems. Okay. So and I, I was feeling really stuck. Like I just didn't know because the world was almost too big. So I tried out a few things and I realized this isn't it, that it wasn't it. Anyway, one morning I kind of woke up, like I, I got myself a life coach to help me figure it out. And I was going to go to Spain to have a weekend retreat with this woman because there was nothing closer to home for cheaper. Um, and COVID hit. So I was oh. like, ah, oh. So I wasn't able to go, but um, anyway, in the meantime, I kind of woke up one morning, you know, early morning, you know, how your brain works. Um, and it, like this light went on and said, I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to be a coach for people who were stuck like I was. Like I just, it wasn't necessary for things to be so miserable when you, you know, your kids take over your life, your husband takes over your life, your business takes over your life, all of these things. So originally I was going to be a life coach. So I started on that path, but the coaching program that like the training that I did was more generic. It wasn't for life coaching. It wasn't for business coaching. It was just how to be a coach. So and so I got, I want to ask you, Carly. So what kind of questions were you asking yourself when you were looking for a life coach? 
I wanted somebody who was um, like, what? I'm kind of somebody who likes results quickly. I'm not like this. Let's take six months and figure it out. I'm oh, like, well, I need- welcome to the construction industry. <laughs> 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 yes. So one of the biggest things I was looking for is somebody who um, obviously had some experience, like, you know, and I could connect with somebody that I watched her stuff. I watched her videos. I connected with her on a Zoom call and just um, somebody that I could connect with and feel comfortable with. And then also somebody who offered like a quick, I just need like, I wanted a concentrated weekend of digging deep into my guts to figure out what it was. And she offered that. And that was, um, that was pretty much the deciding factor. Okay. Okay. So, um, fast forward, I started on the life coaching thing and then I realized that I really missed the business part. Um, I was, uh, my plan was to work with business women but I was missing the like the the guts of the business, that stuff that I got to really dig into in our business. And I was missing doing that. And I thought, well, why don't I do business coaching for women? That's what I started on. And then well, that's what I continued with. And then it was like, okay, well, what's my niche? Because everybody knows you can't do for everybody. And I really was hesitant to choose women in construction because of course there's, you know, such a small percentage of women um, construction owners at the same time, though, I knew that that was me and I could identify with them. I was one of them and I really wanted to help them because I know that I know how I felt in the, that position. And I knew my life didn't have to be as difficult as it was. And I wanted to make the life of those people a little easier. So that's when I committed to it. It's like, this is what I'm going to do. And here I am. When you went first into it, was, was it a bigger task for you? Like when, because you're, you're coming from it, right? And you knew that, okay, here's my niche, here's my segment. But going into it, did you quickly realize that it's actually a bigger situation than I originally thought? Or was it a smaller situation? Oh, no, it was, it was huge in that when I had my business, I didn't do sales. I didn't do marketing. I did business development. I did the business stuff. That's the stuff I love. But building your own business from the ground up in a niche that doesn't know you exist and that you don't have the network for. Like I was a behind the scene, behind the scenes building a business person in our business. So it was a completely different uh, role that I was playing. And it has been a lot of work. There have been many days where I'm like, I just want to throw in the towel. <laughs> it, it's hard. Like it is hard. Yes. At the same time, I'm so committed to it and I'm so passionate about it that I'll never give up no matter how slow it is or, you know, the tra- getting the traction and the momentum and all of those things. I will continue because I truly believe there's a need for it, especially um, with women being stuck the way they are in their career in the construction industry. I think self-employment for those who are interested um, is a potential solution. Yeah. And um, I want to be somebody to provide that support so they don't feel like I need to leave the industry. I'd really like to start this business, but I don't even know what that looks like. I'm just going to go do something else. I just don't want to see that happen. A lot of the comments, I mean, we get a lot of comments from the show and a lot of the comments on on the guests that are on the show and things that are said. And I think a constant theme that comes up every so often that I get reached out for is a lot of people feel like they were always alone. They didn't realize that so many other people were going through the exact same problems that I'm going through. So I almost feel like women, especially, but a lot of men in the industry, they Mm. feel like that lone person who can't reach out to anybody, let alone want to reach out to another fellow tradesperson to speak to. They rather Mm -hmm. speak to somebody else that understands our industry and then try to get their insight into their business so they can learn Mm. better. But there's a lot of intimidation there. Like Corley, there's a lot of like, I don't want to look stupid for asking any question. Right. So, I mean, do you yeah. see that because you're, you're coaching women, but you're, you're still coaching men as well, too? Yeah. I, so because of the fractional work that I do and the training and things like that, I certainly work with men as well. Um, as far as the business coaching, that is mostly for women. And the reason I do that is because I want to bring like minded women together. And if I were to have men and women, I would bring it. You know, you can only do so many at a time. And so I think that it would be kind of, again, uh, more men than women. And that's not the environment I want to create. I want to be like-minded women together, you know, working together and, you know, exactly what you're saying, not alone. Like, yeah. because when you're a woman as a business owner in the construction industry, you are one of one at that table. Like there are just not other women there with you. And, um, I wanted to create that space. I might fair to say, um, women are better at the business part of the industry than men are. Um, I think I, I think more. they are. 
I think. Yeah, they yeah, they are definitely um, more willing, I would say, and more um, understanding of what needs to get done. I think. Yes. I think men are more like, ah, you know, I'll just do this or I'll just do that. <laughs> Women are like, okay, how do I do this properly? How do you know? They're more interested in like getting it done. The details, you know, that's one of the you know, sort of the feminine energy things around women is, you know, attention to detail is usually a little bit greater. And so that shows in here as well. How do you, how do you, how do you start the whole process? Like, I'm curious when you first, someone reaches out to you and they, I guess they give you a grocery list of problems that they're facing and then you kind of discuss things with them. Is that how it normally works? So once, you know, once we start actually working together, you know, we take two hours, the very first meeting and just dive into everything that's going on and prioritize, like, what is the the biggest issue? And we start there. And then we work through that. And as other things, because inevitably things come up, like if I was to, you know, take somebody like with the group coaching that I do to take that group, I bring them through a specific program, a specific um, path. However, when I'm working one on one, because I usually I mostly work one on one, I'm yet to fill a full group. So um, that's a specific, like I said, specific path for that one. But with the people I work with one on one, it's finding out what their biggest issue is currently diving into that, fixing that. And like I said, inevitably, as we talk, the next thing comes up and we just work through what they need to um, do to get where they want to be. Okay, and then how do um, the women that you've been working with, how do they look at the construction industry? versus how the men look at the construction industry. I, I'm assuming there's a difference there. That's interesting because a lot of the women that I work with um, aren't necessarily, like some of them are tradespeople and have been in the industry a long time. Quite a few of them are people who started with, you know, buying a house and flipping it and going that route. So it's a little bit different in that they don't necessarily have the same just the women to women that I'm talking about here. Yeah. They don't have necessarily the same view on the construction industry, just, you know, different experiences, I guess is what that is. So females versus males. Um, I think just the nature of the experience kind of is like women are a little bit more um, driven. I'll say driven in that. Like, I think it's, you know, they feel that whole imposter syndrome thing that they always are working through and they feel like I need to make this work to prove whether it be to somebody else or to themselves that I belong here, that I can do this, where men are a little bit more laid back in that approach. They're like a little bit more confident, I guess, just as far as their ability to make it work. One, one thing I want to ask you is that I do see um, specifically from a lot of men that I've spoken to, people in the industry do not know how to balance things. They really, it's all in, like you're either consumed by your job and your tasks and you forget your family and fun. Um, and I mean, I'm sure that you talk to your clients that way as well. You try to figure out how to get a balance. Everybody's constantly, especially in this industry, trying to get that balance. How do you approach that? I don't, I don't think there is such thing as balance. I think it's when you spend your time wherever it is, it's quality time. It has to be quality time because there are going to be phases like, you know, construction is very seasonal. So there is going to be times when business is slow and there's going to be times when business is hopping. So you need to be able to you know, address that and service that need with your business and your family. Of course, there's going to be times when it's busy and there's times when it's, you know, maybe not as busy and you need to be able to balance that as well. So I think that really I don't talk to them about um, balancing like hour for hour and it's not even week for week. It's more so let's just make sure where you're focusing your time at the moment is quality time and focused, because I know one of the biggest issues I had was I was. You know, when I was working on my business, I was thinking about my family and feeling guilty. And when I was with my family, I was thinking about the business. I was never present. I was never able to be present because the other thing was always pulling on me. So that's one thing I really, I focused on in, you know, as I was developing my business and putting it actually, you know, turning it into a business. Um, that's something that was hard for me because one thing I never, you know, never prioritized myself and I never did the things I needed to do because I was either working on my family or my business, my family or my business. But as women, especially what we need, to, well, everybody, but women, especially, we always put ourselves last. And when we, when we can just move yeah. ourselves up that priority list, yeah, you do. it feels everything so much better. So money's a big thing. All the entrepreneurships and, and like everybody's mm -hmm. trying to build a business and then they're constantly working. And that's where the balance question came from. It's, it's like this motivating factor of money and, and especially in today's economy and how everybody's being hit hard and how everything is, you're getting a lot of tradespeople trying to figure out how do I maximize my efficiency? How do I 
get more dollar, save more dollar, I guess, out of every dollar. How are you speaking to them on that kind of level? Well, I think that a lot of the women that I work with are, you know, either they have pretty small teams. So it's really talking about a planning, you know, as much as you can, because in the construction industry, we all know that you can make a plan and it all goes to crap the next day as soon as you try to, you know, execute that plan. Yeah. But it's really, you know, having some systems in place and it's starting with the simple things, because if you can take some of those emergencies that you see all the time and put a system in place for that or some sort of process in place for that, then at least it doesn't consume so much time every time. It really is starting with the basics because, I mean, as far as saving money and being smart with money, those are very, you know, you can make sure you're making returns and voice on time. Like there's some very uh, tactical kinds of things that you could do to make sure you're taking care of your money. But to increase efficiency, I think it really is about putting processes in place so that you're not repeating tasks the first time every time. Like that is really um, a really big time saver. How do you, Corley, how do you talk to them when, um, and I was like this as well, when, my first year in construction, I was hungry, passionate. I was always driven to try to build something new, try to learn something creative, mm -hmm. how to better my skills. So you've got this devil on your shoulder, so to speak, constantly telling you, you can do better, you can build better, you can do all kinds of things. But at, at some point you have to figure out where do I stop? Like how high do mm -hmm. I climb that mountain before I start realizing maybe I don't really want to go all the way to the top. I actually want to just get to a certain level and then maybe hand it off to somebody else. How do I get to that point? Well, it's interesting because one of the first part of that first conversation is, you know, what do you want to do with your business? What is your plan with your business? Because most people are kind of like that. Well, as far as they don't know what the end goal is. Yes. And I think that's kind of where you need to start is do you plan on selling it? Do you just plan on working until as a single person until you retire? Or do you want to build a team? Like, what do you want to do with your business? And when you get that, at least that idea, then it helps you to, you know, set a few other goals. Because one of the things which is interesting um, I find is that a lot of the people that I work with don't actually have an end goal, whether it be they with don't. their business or yeah. in their life or anything like they don't think goals. They don't think of what they're working towards. They're all really focused yes. on just getting the next job and paying the next bill. And it's just like, let's, let's step back and think a little bit bigger and, you know, create a vision for yourself. You know, it's those, the vision, the mission, the core values, all of those things that really create what your business is, as opposed to just being a job. Like, so many people just think of it as a job and this ability to do things. But when you give them the freedom to think bigger and what's possible for them, you can just see the smiles and the excitement. Yeah. But without that, you don't, without that possibility thinking, you don't really have that same excitement. It really is. You get lost in the mud of today's shit. <laughs> I've told lots of tradespeople to, to honestly schedule me days. And that's including mm -hmm. for myself, right? I, I just said, Fine. You, you get up at you get up at the same time. You get your work wear on. You get the, the job started. You get everything going, but don't necessarily go to the job site. Make sure that mm -hmm. it's running what it's supposed to be doing that day. But take three, four hours to yourself and ask these hard questions and mm -hmm. honestly answer these hard questions, because if you're not asking them, you're just going to constantly just do what you just said. And if you're not finding a really good answer to them, then you really don't know where you are going at that point. Yeah, at all. And it's just going to be, you're going to be on this constant wheel, the hamster wheel, just constantly, constantly, constantly with never, yeah, you're with never having the on. opportunity to exit. Yeah. <laughs> let me, let me do a little history and construction. Um, I just want to share some, uh, is this, no, this ain't the right one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we had a slight cancellation this morning. Uh, um, it's that one there. Sorry. Sorry, Angelina. It's that one right there. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Corley. Uh, stats for women in construction. So these were the stats that we came from, well, that we found, Angelina found. Uh, in the U.S., a number of studies from this year reported that women make up roughly 10.9% of the overall construction workforce, up 1% from 2020. They found that women account for 25 of tradespeople, 5% of contractors, and 4% of construction managers. That's kind of in line with what you have, uh, have come across, yeah? Yeah, uh, of that 10.9, a lot of it is actually, um, a lot of the women, it is, you know, office admin yes. in, you know, the 2.5 of the tradespeople. I think that's the number that we need to really think about and work on because I think that's where um, 
Yeah, that's where we... We need more. We want more. Sure. Yes. In Canada, 2017 study found that women make up roughly 12.4% of the overall construction workforce. A 2020 study reported that women make up of 5% of the tradespeople, up 1.1% from 2017. Uh, 2017 study also reported that women make up of 38.5% of offsite workers in construction. Stats can looked at apprenticeships uh, in major construction fields and found that women, on average, between 2015 and 2019, made up 1% brick lane, uh, 4% carpentry. These are the apprenticeships. Uh, yeah. 5% of construction craft worker, 3% electricians, 2% of plumbers, and 3% all of all the construction apprenticeships. Apprentices. Wow. Um, so we know that these are really small numbers and we have yeah. to make these numbers a lot larger. We definitely have to, right? So we're, we're oh, tr- yeah, not yeah. just, not just because our, you know, our labor, uh, pool. No, is, no not uh, for that reason. No. Just, we need to, we need to get the women in there. You know, their skill set. I think is one that, um, the construction industry really needs. And, um, I think that we need to talk a little bit more about that as far as, you know, it's something that's always been missing is the attention to detail, the communication, because everything we do is about relationships. And because women typically are better at relationship building and communicating, like if we could just bring more women into, you know, bring that element to grow that element of the construction industry, I think a lot would be better. So I kind of go back to, and you don't intimidate me. You seem like a very sweet person. But a lot of people in construction are, they're afraid. They're afraid to either ask for help, ask that question, or just even have a conversation. They're just nervous about it. How would you suggest that some of anybody in, in the industry to kind of, I guess, uh, spearhead that conversation, tackle it? Yeah, this is one of the big things that I talk to, talk about everywhere and anywhere is that um, with the women that I work with, especially, but all people, um, confident, fear and confidence are the two biggest issues that I see. And it's that imposter syndrome, again, especially for women, but even for men. I mean, especially young apprentices coming up, like they still feel intimidated by the yes. people that are there already doing it. So I, I talk a lot about that and I talk to them about, you know, the fact that the construction industry, there is a place for everybody. Yes. There is a place for yes. everybody in the construction industry. Yes. I don't care how awkward, weird, unusual, whatever you call yourself, there's a place for you here. And I think that having the conversation about, um, you know, what you've accomplished and how you've, you know, all the things that you've succeeded. And we talk about um, just exploring confidence and having them realize that they're not as out of place as they feel like they are. And then I just give them some strategies to go back to those things because um, it's something you need to work on constantly all the time. And once you can just, I think the confidence for all young people, even, you know, us old people, is something we always need to be working on because um, it's an ever-changing world and you always kind of feel a little um, maybe not good enough. <laughs> no, and we all, we're all fish out of water in the very beginning. We, we, mm-hmm. we don't know everything and we, that's why I'm always encouraging everybody to ask and don't be afraid and hopefully you'll come across other like-minded people that will in, you know embrace you, bring you into it, and then they can educate you. I do kind of like and not kind of like you have the older workforce that's leaving the industry, mm. and then you've got a big chunk of the younger that's kind of coming up the ranks. And um, But there is that little middle point where we're losing. And, and I, I really wish that the older would possibly stay maybe even a little bit longer or maybe even do some consulting to further continue educating both men and women in the industry. Are you seeing any of that? Because I mean, I see it micro, but I don't see a lot mm. of it because I think that when they get to a certain point, they're like, okay, good riddance, I'm done, I'm out. I'm tapping out and that's it. That's that's more what I see than anything. I think that um, you have to be really, I think that middle group that you're talking of, that's kind of, we're losing. I think that's the group that's more open to being mentors and showing the way, the people that obviously are staying. Um, the older group that I think they've been in the industry for too long and are 
um, on a bigger scale. Like not, there are definitely some really great older, like I've seen some women who have talked about some of their mentors yeah. who have been, you know, old guys and have just tucked them under their wing and really taken care of them. So that I think is beautiful. Um, but that's kind of the exception. Most of them have been kind of um, on my way out. I've put my time in and I'm done. Uh, so I think that middle group of people is the one that we really need to target as far as, you know, being mentors for the ones that are coming up. And I think that they're more open to it. It's more something that they're part of that conversation and probably more likely to take action on it. So one other- thing actually I want to talk about though, yeah, going, cool. just going back for a second with, you know, the, having those hard conversations and feeling um, lacking confidence. One of the things I want to talk about, because I always talk about this as well. And I think it's something that is for, especially for people in construction, women in construction is vulnerability. Okay. I think that we are afraid and I was, let me tell you, I was, um, afraid to look weak, afraid to not know, and don't like to put ourselves in that space of being vulnerable. And I think once we realize that being vulnerable is actually like what I call a superpower, you let your, you can let your guard down and you can just be yourself and own what you don't know because nobody knows everything. Just nobody does. And so when you can allow yourself to be vulnerable and just say, I don't know this. And even if somebody snaps at you, Them snapping at you because how can you not know this? It's not about you. It's about them. And I think when having this part of the conversation, recognizing that everybody's response, reaction, however they are around you, whether they love you or hate you, that is about them. And when you can disassociate, dissociate yourself from other people's judgment of you, it helps. And it's easier, a whole lot easier said than done, of course. However, I think it's really important to start that conversation, hear that conversation, because when you can be vulnerable, it's like you take back control. Yeah. You don't have to fear anything like, oh, I don't know that I can't let them see. It also helps with imposter syndrome, because then all of a sudden you're not that imposter anymore because you can be free to say what it is that you don't know. Yeah. So I think that that is a conversation that we need to have more of as well. Just I think a lot of us see being vulnerable as a weakness. I know I did. I never asked for help. I never, like I could always just take care of it myself. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it until I couldn't anymore. And the point that came that I'm like, I I, I just need to ask for help. And it was the first thing it was, I had to ask my neighbor to watch two of my kids while I went to, I can't even remember what it was. I just need to go run and do something. I couldn't take my kids with me. And it was the first time I asked anybody for help. And it was difficult to say the least but at the same time after that it was just like oh I can do this and she was happy to help like that's the thing is that we think that oh they're going to judge us and they're going to be squirrely about it or whatever but people are almost always willing to help somebody who's worth your time to be actually care what they think is going to be happy that you asked is going to be more than willing to have that conversation with you it's funny you bring that up because I mean a lot of people that do know me they know me. I, I've always been an introvert. I've always been a quiet. I was. I never sat at the front of the class. Um, I always try to bury myself into the seat, and I didn't want to be recognized or noticed or anything like that. But when I got into construction, there was thousands of questions to ask. And at first, I was intimidated to ask these questions. I was nervous. I was afraid to ask it. Then I just realized one day I was in a in a shop. I was just in a tool shop and just shopping around. And I had all these questions in my head. And all of a sudden, I was just speaking loudly. I just said, I don't care. I don't give a shit anymore. And I just said, I said to the salespeople, I, I had a question. I asked a question. And I made sure I was loud. I wanted to make sure I was loud because I knew there was other tradespeople in the, around me, right? And I quickly realized that they were listening and all of a sudden some stranger came up to me and suggested something that answered my question and i was like thank you nice to meet you and it went on and then i thought man this actually works and then i got on a job site and i never knew anything like i was always asking questions so i was never afraid so i'm a little bit of a a jaded contractor because i've never had the stigmas where if i see the new tradesperson on site male or female i'm always encouraging them to try something here you go here's an opportunity i don't care about you grabbing a broom I did, that's a, like a, everyone's going to grab a broom clean up. That's just mandatory. Everybody does it. But if you want to try this trowel, you want to try this saw, you want to try this stuff. I would always encourage them to do it, ask how to use it, how to do it or whatever, because I wanted people to just speak louder. So then other trades people can hear you. And then I guarantee you out of that clan 
one of them will come up to you and approach you and give you the answer, suggest a solution. And I, mm. it worked. It totally worked. And it gave me confidence to build newer things, different ideas. And all of a sudden I became the go-to guy. Well, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that, Manny? And it worked. It really did. I love that because I think that so often um, new apprentices especially can get, you know, kind of pigeonholed into yes. doing a thing, especially on a commercial size kind of project you can get pigeonholed into doing like this is the thing that you're going to do for the next six months and you just don't have the opportunity to learn or expand your skills or you know explore your trade at all and I think that you know to have those opportunities like when we had our business because we were relatively small and we did so many things whether you liked it or not you might be a plumber but if you want to be working today you need to go put in some sheet metal you know and just expands their skill set And so it doesn't have to be, you know, trade to trade like that, but just, you know, even within your own trade, just having the opportunity to explore different possibilities. And I think that that's one thing that people also don't see is how many possibilities and the opportunities that are available, whether it be, you know, in your own trade or the, you know, your sistering trades. And I would also suggest, because there was a guy that I was working with, he did a great Christopher Walken accent. Uh, and I loved it. And every time he would suggest something just to hear any kind of construction dialogue in a Christopher Walken, you know, dialogue, I was just always peeing my pants. I was like, this is absolutely (laughs) hilarious. So all the young guys and girls out there that want to get started, if you can do voices or you can do something funny, you can razz a different trade or whatever, have some fun with it because I guarantee Mm -hmm. you someone's going to pay attention. They're going to be likable and they're going to approach you and they're going to help you. And that's what we want. Yeah. And anybody else who gives you a hard time is not worth your time. Oh, no. no. Ignore them, push them out and they're gone. They're not going to even last in that environment. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay. So where do you want to go from here? Corlea, like, where do you want to tackle now? Um, well, we haven't, um, I don't know. We talked a lot about business stuff and (laughs) the trades, you know, I think one of the things, and I know you talk about this on a lot of your podcasts, so I, I ne- not necessarily, you know, I think that where we were talking about as far as um, employers and uh, treating your employees right and creating that culture and environment and leadership, because leadership is another thing I do a lot of training on, because I think a lot of like, even as I don't know if you see my background here, I have this pipe. Yeah. This pipe, it's all melted and deformed. And when we first got that piece of pipe, it came out of an install that we did on a furnace and, or maybe it was a hot water tank, tell you the truth. I don't know. I'm not the technical one. I think actually it was a hot water tank. And it was, we kept that because originally we're like, this is going to be a reminder that we don't want employees, blah, blah, blah. Um, Because one of our employees didn't know what he's doing. He put in this thing. He was a, he was a trained plumber, like a journey person plumber and put in the wrong piping on this. I think it was a hot water tank on a, and um, it started to melt. We were thankfully called there for something else. We saw this because it could have killed people. Like it was very, it's a serious thing. And what we realized through, you know, the time from the time we got that piece of pipe to the time we are now and all of the growth that we've done over our years is that this piece of pipe is now for us to be a good leader. It's not about, not having employees, crappy employees, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. If you have crappy employees, I mean, yeah, there's crappy people, but it's chances are it's because you're not a good leader. And we learned that um, almost the hard way, but uh, thankfully we didn't. And so we focused a lot on leadership, just, you know, as business owners at the time. And then for me, uh, since then, just learning more as much as I could about being a good leader, because I think that a lot of us tr- as business owners, you try to put it off to your people and trades people, you know, as they come up the ranks, like for us, we had um, some of our employees that we had for many, many years, they started as an apprentice, they came through, were a really good j- trades person, not just a journey person in their trade, but a trades person. And, you know, we kind of started to elevate them into project management roles and so forth. But what we need to understand is that just because you're a really good trades person does not mean you're a good leader. Yeah. And there, you need to invest in your people. So I think that leadership is also a really important element of the construction industry, building a strong, good business that we need to be aware of again, awareness and um, watch for because good leadership starts at the top. Yes. You can't pass on that responsibility. You can't pass that duty on to the people below you. Why don't you just be the leader? No, no, no. It starts with you. And um, I think that that's, a really uh, critical component of building a successful business. And I do find, and I totally agree with you on that. I do find that every tradesperson is eventually going to be a leader. 
And so mm. you might as well make notes along the way to figure out how you're going to be a better leader at that point and, and figure out what the new problems are going to be because that's what construction is all about. There's always going to be a constant list of problems and you have to solve it. That's what we do. That's what, mm-hmm. you know, all of us do in this industry that we're just major problem solvers at that point. Um, I wanted to ask you, Coralie, is like, generally speaking, what do the women think of the men in this industry? I know that's kind of a oh. huge umbrella, but yeah, and that's varied. Most of the most of the women that I surround myself with and work with think highly of them. Like okay. they have, um, they recognize that there are a lot of really good men in the industry, and there is a small, small portion that kind of ruins it for everybody. The dinosaurs. Because one of the main reasons that one of the top reasons women leave the industry is because of toxic toxic environment. Yes, and that's such a small group, and I think most of us recognize. I think I spoke with one woman who was like, no, she was, she left the industry and she's like, no, she had such a bad experience. She had no hope for any of it. Like they were just all bad. But other than that, most of them see men as our allies and that that is really the path to making our space within the industry. And we obviously need to work together. And most of them, you know, recognize that um, most of the men are good. They're just, the loud ones are the ones and the ones that stand out are the ones that aren't so great. I call them dinosaurs. You know, they're just, they're, they're some sort of, I don't know, trade source. I don't know what that is. Well, you know, what's interesting. This lady that I was telling you about in particular, about her having this old guy that uh, took her under his wing yeah. was like really, um, her experience, because most of the women I spoke with is like, you know, it's that um, older generation and they're on their way out, but it was with speaking with her and I have a couple other people since then, um, their experience has actually been the opposite where they've had good experience with the dinosaurs, the old guys, and the younger ones have been the problem. And that kind of really disheartened me because I was kind of hopeful that as, you know, we see these old guys move out that we would have a new mindset come in and it's not necessarily the case. Well, you're going to have the bad apples in, you know, the older bush uh, yeah. bushel, and you're going to have bad apples in the younger bushel, right? It's just how it is. And I think that, yeah, I think um, I've been fortunate enough. I, I personally have never seen any of that. You know, I've always seen everybody get along. I've had plenty of job sites where I've had men and women on the site. I've had plenty of job sites where I've had the old guys and the young guys and the in between guys. And it's just everybody gets along. But I mean, I've also said that if I ever saw something that I didn't think was right, I'd speak up. I'm not going to mm-hmm. turn a blind eye to anything, right? So I'll definitely have a conversation. I'm not going to do it loudly. I'm going to do it professionally and I'm going to be courteous about it, but I don't I don't want anybody to be that way on a site, on my job site. Mm-hmm. We're all it's a team. Like I keep going back to construction is a family. It's a team. We're together. There's there's not one single person that could build everything by themselves. You need other hands working there. So we all have to work together. Um, that's yeah. one of the reasons why I sang that song. Yeah, it's Bob great. Builder. <laughs> <laughs> Having fun, getting the work done. Like, it, you know, sure, it's a cartoon, but you know, that's that's the goal. That's the goal is to make this fun and for us to work together because we all are working towards a common goal. Why don't we like work together to get there? So yes, I I agree. Are you nervous about next year and the economy turning? Are you seeing some of your clients kind of wondering? You're not? No. Oh no, they're definitely wondering. Okay. I'm not worried about it because. I went through 2008 as a business owner, and that was in the years that we didn't have our, we did not have ourselves organized yet. That was still like in the first uh, six or seven years of our business. And we made it through 2008, 2009, 10 in our business when we had like shambles of a business. Good for you. Yeah. Um, We survived. It was a lot of stress. Let me tell you that we pivoted though, pivoted, pivoted. (laughs) We changed, you know, (laughs) it was, so it wasn't so much new construction. Things changed to more renovations. Like the work changes. You need to be um, open to changing it, what it is that you're focusing on. If you're, you need to be watching what the market is doing. You need to be watching where people are spending their money and you need to be willing to do what needs to get done to keep yourself going. So I know that there's a lot of possibilities. I know that there's going to be a lot of changes and this is, you know, yes, my people, because they have, most of them have not been through that. I'm going to say all, none of them were through that. Um, So they don't know, but I definitely, I'm like almost in a, 
I'm an optimist. Like I, I always think the best is going to happen because why not? Um, so I talk to them about it and let them know that these are the things that we'll need to do um, within your business. Be open to it. Let's see what happens when you see something slowing down or changing. You need to be, have your head up and be ready to shift. And then I'm, I'm curious, Carly, um, both men and women, I mean, uh, but women are probably have solved this problem a lot better than men have. Uh, how do you deal with the tradesperson that just is blind? And they just say, there's actually nothing wrong with me. I'm perfect. Uh, <laughs> everything's working great. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking Because you've heard this before. Yeah. You've seen it, right? And by the way, everybody, you're not perfect. Nobody is. <laughs> no. And truthfully, I don't work with those people. That yeah. Those are not my people. Um, I work with people who um, are... Uh, who have some self-awareness like yeah, that's comes in what it down like do you have some self-awareness like somebody like that to me has zero awareness yes. because um we all have problems we all have challenges and we all need to better ourselves we, well we all can better ourselves yes. Yes. so if you choose not to whatever that's your choice but yeah i don't i typically don't work with those people um even in the you know the offices or the people that i work with um i don't come across a lot of them <laughs> Yeah, no. No, I know they're out there. I've heard it. And I and, and I just, I look at them as if um, that's the punchline or is that the joke? Which one is it? I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, yeah. But if, if you were to tell anybody that's listening right now, what are the, some of the top things that they can go home and, and assess, reassess what's going on in their business? And uh, what are some things that you can share about that? To reassess in their business? Well, I... <laughs> That really depends on where they're at as far. The biggest thing that I see, of course, is like the numbers and um, reassess. It's like, are you doing things like pre-planning? Are you like, how do you approach your projects? Because I think the success of a project starts before the project starts. It's like, how prepared are you to get into this project? Are you having like a team meeting before you get started? What are the expectations of the project? Who, who are we answering to? What is the chain of command as such? Although I think, you know, everybody's kind of equal. It's like, you need to have some sort of, um, line of communication to manage the project properly. So it's doing things like that ahead of the project actually starting and everybody really understanding what the goal of the project is. What are the priorities? So I think that, you know, do you have a system like that that's in place? Are you prepared when you go into your projects, whether it's a one day job or a six month job? Are you prepared? I think that that is a really big question to ask yourself. And I think preparation is key, whether you're talking about your day, like just going into your day, into your week, your year, I think always thinking ahead of what you want to be doing, setting those goals. Are you setting goals? Because a lot of, like we talked earlier, a lot of people aren't even setting goals yeah. for themselves. So oh, go ahead. Well, they're, they're in a rat race. So they're always trying to catch up. And, and that brings me to, and it's a good, it's valid that you brought, brought that up. It brings me to my next point where, uh, how far ahead should we be looking? How far ahead should we be planning? What, what, like, how, how should we be looking at this, all this stuff, our futures? Yeah. Well, I think when we are in this space that we're in right now, and it's a little bit unpredictable, um, it's difficult to look too far ahead. I think always have your end goal in mind, but never be fixed on the path to get you there. Like figure out the what and know what that is. Like, what are you working towards? And then don't be so fixed and focused on the how be open to moving as you go. Because like I said, you know, in these unpredictable times, sometimes you might need to change what it is that you're doing in order to um, get to that goal. Like, you know, go around, the, go around a bit. It's not never, it's never a straight line no, from point A no. to point B and be willing to be flexible because I think that that, um, keeps your like I have like me I'm like a mindset is everything person and I think that when you have um, an open mind to what's possible then you can make your way there just don't get fixed on it is um yeah so this is construction and construction does have a dark side and there is some negativity in this industry how do you uh speak to your clients and anybody that's in the industry about uh, regarding failures we always have some setbacks we always have some loss of financial failures or even projects and and whatever there's uh there's conflict the uh, disputes and things like that how would you address or how would you ask people to handle those situations so depending on what the, like, if you're talking employee conflicts or if you're talking about customer conflicts, like there's a lot of, there's, yeah. yeah. So one of my biggest things is 
don't get your emotions involved with whatever it is. Stick to the facts because it helps you to stay calm. Like that was one of my biggest strengths, I think, in the managing the way I had to manage um, difficult customers. I always went into those conversations with, I'm not going to be able to convince them of my position and why I'm right. You know, I need to understand from their perspective. And I need to address this situation from their perspective and help them through it. So one is, you know, listen to actually understand, don't listen to respond. I think that that's a really important thing when you're talking conflict. And also, because I remember there was this one time when we, um, some of our employees were working out of town and they did not get along. And I was like, I don't know, eight months pregnant with my third kid. So it made my other kids like three and one. And I get this call that they're ready to go fisticuffs. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, so I needed to, they were about an hour from where I was. So I got in my car, loaded up my kids, went up to site and I needed to like calm them down, like just bring them down. And it's, you need to leave the emotions out of it. You need to stick to the facts. And I think that when you can just, um, when you can do that and be like, so for failures, for example, um, recognize that it's a lesson. Like do whatever you can to not attach yourself to it. It doesn't define you. It doesn't say you are a failure. It says this situation didn't work out the way you intended. What did you learn? So I I think it's a lot of just not making it about you. That is, I think, such a big thing, whether you're dealing with people or situations. And I think another um, thing that I was going to say as far as, you know, conflict and difficult situations Um. Can't remember. No, that's fine. That's I get the same way too because I just it, it comes up. A lot of people ask me, and and I mean I know that it's not the best topic to discuss or bring up, but it is a part of the industry. It doesn't matter uh, if you're a tradeswoman or a tradesman. You're you're gonna you might potentially get into this situation, but I definitely think that you should be prepared. And I agree with you 100. percent The moment you can get yourself out of it and not make it personal and just make it professional and understanding the other side, hoping they will understand your side, a resolution will eventually show its head, right? As soon as they know that you're you're coming from a perspective of yes. understanding them, yes. they are more open to, like they can't escalate it. When you are like, I understand what you're saying. I, I believe that this is what you, is true to you, whatever, however you want to approach it. Um, they can't escalate from there. They can't get more angry as soon as you're like, no, this is the way it was. You're like, you know, and it just escalates. But when you come at it with no emotion and just stick to the facts and understand them, they have nothing to grow off of. What I was going to say, actually, with the, as far yeah. as the um, the learning, the growing, the failures, what I remember is what we did. And I think is really important to do also in those situations, whether it be losing money on a project or something didn't go as you intended, um, do postmortems. Like once the project is done, be that have that be part of your process projects done what did we do well what did we not do well where could we do things differently i think that that's a really important uh part of the process of any size project because and sometimes you need to do it along the way like when you see that you know we went over on this part and you know maybe you're not finished the job yet you now you have 10 percent of the budget left to do 20 percent of the work you know what is what happened to this point like it's always learning and reviewing um what you're doing along the way and making sure that you fix the things that went wrong so they don't happen again. I think that lessons, we need the lessons. That's how we become stronger and better. However, if you need to learn that lesson a second time, that's when it may become a a problem. (laughs) I've actually been, and I've been doing this myself too, is I've been keeping a daily journal. Mm -hmm. So you're on a job site and, and a, a million things are going on. And just at the end of the day or the middle of the day, whatever, just make some notes in the journal and just kind of tell, tell yourself, okay, what happened today? Everything went smooth. Everything didn't go smooth. Clients are upset. Clients are extremely happy. Just make some key notes of your daily events. And then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. before you know it, you'll have a nice story about exactly, but also you can go back and review everything and then you can get a sense of, okay, where did the wheels fall off? And then, mm-hmm. you know, how did we solve that situation and then learn from those situations? That's really key. That's good because that's one of one of the things we did is we kept a, a log of daily activity, but it didn't go to that level. Like it was more so what did we do? What yeah. was, you know, if a change uh, notice came up or, you know, something came you know like that, but not to that extent where it's really um, analyzing what went well and what didn't on a daily basis. I like that. Well, I just find that 
trades people in general, the men that I've spoken to, is uh, there's there, there's no reservations about sharing what's going on on their daily, right? So I just figure they'd be the same way if they're writing it down. And if they're in their truck or their van or their work vehicle and all of a sudden something's going on, good or bad, make a note of it. Just make a mm -hmm. note of it and describe it and talk about it. And then, like you said earlier, what did you actually or what are you learning from it? And then it, it's just going to make you a better person, a better trades person. That's all it's going to do. Exactly. And actually make your business better, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I want to do a little OBC talk. Uh, glazed openings and exposing building face. Windows? Is that what it is? I think it's the right one. <laughs> I was a building envelope consultant in my old. In Were my you old really? Life, my yeah, so it's appropriate. We we just had we just had uh, we had a consultant. He's not an official one, but he he had a lot of great suggestions, and we're talking about it. So, and he's German too, so that kind of helped mm. as well. Uh, a glazed yes. opening is any opening in a building that has glass, including windows, glass blocks, skylights, glass doors. Uh, the maximum area of a glazed opening that is allowed in a building is expressed as a percentage of the total area of the building face. It is dependent on the limited distance, aka distance between the building face and either a property line or center line of a street or an imaginary line between two buildings on the same property. So it's always these calculations that you got to address. So uh, that's why when we're looking at the size of homes and you're looking at your neighbor, you have minimum amount of glass and it's also uh, contributed to the fire code. So for a standard two meter, which is six foot limiting space distance, a building can face, uh, a building face can have 21% glazed openings if the area is 10 square feet sorry, 10 square meters, and then it's 15% glazed opening if the area is 20 square meters, and it's 9% glazed openings if the area is 100 square meters, and lastly, it's 8% glazed openings if the area is more than 100 square meters. Uh, to order to get 100% of an exposed building face by glazed openings, the limiting distance must be 20 feet. It's quite some distance. Nobody has that space. 20, 20 feet or 20 meters, is that feet? 20 feet. I have 20. I have six meters, 20 feet Okay, is what I have, right? If yeah. the building faces areas less than 25. So that's why we always have a challenge and you deal with clients and they're always asking, can we make the windows bigger on the side? Well, here's yeah. the reason why we can't. Um, where do we want to go now? <laughs> I always have so much to talk about. Um, well, there's so much to talk about when you can try to build your business better and not forget to stop building you better. I think I think there's that and I go I mean balance is not really the right word but I mean I I do love the idea that the tradespeople are conscious that they're building their business and they're building themselves. They're working on both. You can't just work 100% on one and ignore the other. You got to do both. Yes, and I think that that's something that like for me honestly that didn't happen until we sold our business. Like I did not start working on um, actually putting time into me, like meditating and doing the things to actually let my brain quiet down because I had numerous sleepless nights where I was like, you know, constantly turning and making notes and figuring this and doing that. So, you know, now that I'm in my next business and I am actually, as much as I said that I wasn't working with my husband again, we have two businesses. <laughs> um, but it, it took me four years to come to that though. Like really, I was just like, all right, I'll do this. But here's the, I'm laying out the rules here. Um, but anyway, we're notwithstanding, like now into our next business is I recognize that I need to, needed to take more time. Um, it only takes a few minutes and it makes such a difference, but I just didn't know how to incorporate that into my day. Like I didn't know how. Um, that's something I also talk to my people about is just, you know, <clears throat> starting your day early. Like I'm, I'm a early, I get up at three 47. Oh, is wow. You I beat me. A, <laughs> I'm at four. I, I uh, yeah, I, I get up a little bit early cause I want to start my yoga at nine or at four o'clock. That's when I start. So I need to get ready to do that. So, um, but I start early and I know that that's extraordinarily early, especially for some people. It doesn't have to be that early. I just, I am an early morning person. Um, so I say to, you know, get up, earlier than you might otherwise do and just give yourself some time to not be rushing, you know, grab this and grab that and get out the door. Like just giving yourself a few minutes to sit down and relax can make a huge difference in your day. And I think we don't do enough of that. So it's definitely part of what I talk to my people about and, um, you know, make them aware of again, it's just like, let's see that because I didn't have that awareness when I was running crazy. You know, I did have 
I have four very young kids and homeschooling them and running a business. And I, I just didn't have any space in my head for anything. So once we sold the business and I could have that space is when I started realizing, oh, wow, I should have been doing this a while ago, you know? But well, it's funny you bring that up because it's true. Um, uh, first of all, a lot of people that actually have my mobile number, uh, I'll get texts in the morning as early as 5 a.m. in the morning, right? It all started with many are you up? And I'm like, of course I'm up, right? And so <laughs> they'll just start picking because everybody is. So there's a large portion of the industry that is waking up so early for the exact same reasons that you brought up. Mm -hmm. and, and you guys leaving your business and stopping the business, every tradesperson is going to get to that point where they're going to have to not put the tool belt on. And that's a big step. And it, mm -hmm. it kind of makes them question whether or not they can or should. And the truth is they can and they should. It's important because they need to evolve from that point and start looking at the business differently and try to mm -hmm. hopefully you've built a team where you can hand off what you used to do on site to somebody else that you trust. And then you can focus on other things and just imagine what other things you can work, work on for that business or other businesses. Yeah. So that whole thing comes down to control as well. And, you know, letting go and having that idea that um, I know how to do it. Nobody's going to know how to do it as well as I do. Yeah. I've been doing this this way for a long time and I'm just going to do it. And I, th I was like that too, you know, <laughs> and when I hired my first admin person, I knew I needed to, because I just couldn't do it all on my own. That was kind of that eight to 10 employee mark. Um, where it's just like, it was, I was always running by emergencies. Okay. We have to hurry up and do an invoicing. That's what I need to do today. I have to hurry up and do some collections. I have to hurry up and do this thing because it was like, all. Oh, like these little bits and it was just d dictated by whatever the demand was at that minute. So I couldn't do that anymore. Like marketing, like that was, like I said, at the beginning that I, I never had to do that. And I never did that, but I knew we got to the point that we needed to start doing that. So when we hired our first admin person, she was going to answer the phones because I didn't have to do that anymore. Uh, she was going to be focusing on building our brand and our marketing, a website, you know, all the things to that we needed to be doing at that point to go to the next level. <clears throat> excuse me. And um, that was hard for me because like my husband said to me, he's like, we can't bring somebody into our mess. And I was like, we have to, like, we can't get out of this mess without somebody. And that's right around the time that we also hired our first business coach. And so they, they were on my side. They're like, you have to. And I was like, yes, thank you. <laughs> so he finally gave in and said, okay. Um, I so love it that you him, described it as the mess. Oh. because it is it's a mess it and, is. And, and, and you shouldn't stop yourself from bringing somebody in to help you with that mess that whole thing about being vulnerable letting yeah. yourself not look perfect yes i've got this mess can you just don't look but come help me clean it up you know like just because that's what you need you just bring somebody in and they can do those little tasks that like answering the phone i tell you like just um that takes so much time managing that person who has these questions and blah, blah, blah. And I just have other things I need to be doing right now. Um, so to have somebody to have the patience to go through those phone calls and to do it properly, because there's a whole process to how you should be answering the phones. And um, I just didn't have the time for that. So when we brought somebody in, all of a sudden there was like time to do things properly and actually like just get a little bit of a flow, which we just never had before that. How do you work with the trades women that you work with regarding um, I guess when you become more friendly, uh, on a job site and everyone's getting along and we're a great team, but then all of a sudden we got personal problems. At what point as an employer to employee, do you stop listening or continue listening? Like, I'm just saying like, everybody's got what's going on drama wise at home and what's going on in friendships and we bring it to work. Um, it might be affecting work. How do we handle those, those scenarios there? It's very relevant for me because we had two employees in particular, one that was um, he had an alcohol and drug abuse problem. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he, some days he just wouldn't show up. He'd be missing for days. And we're like, OK, is he dead? You're worried. Yeah. You know, like um, and then we had this other employee that wore his heart on a sleeve and he was just a disgruntled dude, just not happy ever no matter what you did he was just not going to be happy and um i think that one thing like when it comes to somebody it comes down to one of the big things that you can do to help this situation is make sure you're hiring based on values and not necessarily skill both of these people did not have 
values that we shared, like just different priorities. Um, when it comes to alcohol and drug abuse, that's a little bit different. I think it's not necessarily value based. Obviously, it's challenges in life based. And I'm not going like we worked with him. Um, we worked with him as much as we could to bring him along with us to help. Like we supported him in his uh, treatment that he was going through. We met with him every week to help keep him accountable. And it worked for a period of time, but then it didn't. Um, and ultimately, I mean, he was our probably our best skilled plumber at the time but uh, not a very nice person. Like he would get in these things and he would set us up nasty. And that's actually um, <laughs> when we decided to sell, we we were going through the process of selling our business and it was 5.30 on a, <clears throat> of thinking about it. We hadn't actually done anything. We were just something we were exploring the idea. And it was 5.30 on a Saturday morning. We were in the office working and a text comes in from our best skilled employee accusing us of all of this stuff. And you know how horrible we were. And let me tell you, we were about the best employers that you could get, but he was just, and he had a thing against women. So he like was really had it for me. And my husband said to me, I, I just can't do this anymore. And I said, let's not. And um, that was it. Like the, that was kind of, we've always like, no matter what struggles we had, um, one of us would be like, we can do this, let's do this. You know, let's do this, we can get through this. And we always did. And on that one day, that morning, it was just like both of us were on the same page. And it's just like, let's not do this anymore. And thankfully, we had built our business to a point that we could sell it. Um, but it wasn't wasn't worth it to us anymore as far as the struggle with employees. And it was because we didn't hire according to our values. Like this, yeah. um, this employee had been with us for years, you know, and it was just, it's hard to get rid of your best skilled when the labor pool is so small. And we just could like every time we had question, are we going to get rid of him? It never impacted our customers and it never impacted his work. He just didn't show up some days or he would send these texts to us. But it in impacted the end, you guys. It impacted, What's that? it impacted well, this you is the, guys. Yeah. And at the, it's, it's funny because when we did sell, we told our employees because um, they could stay with the company. You know, there was all these options. And we said, if you stay with us till the end, you'll get $200 for each week that you're with us. And we'll give you a $1,500 bonus at the end. So all he needed to do was be a good person for six weeks. We ended up firing him wow. like two weeks before because he sent one of those texts yes. to one of our other employees. And that was the point at which he crossed the line. I'm like, you can send what you want to us. All right. But when as soon as you cross the line and put it on other people, that's a, that's a no-go. And he got fired. I'm like, dude, you couldn't have just waited another couple of weeks. Yeah. But then th yeah. that's what I mean is like as an employer, you, and especially if you're a good employee, they figure that they can just drop this on your shoulders. And now yeah. you're taking all this on, but you have your own, like everybody has their own going on in life and everything like that. So it's just, you try to keep a, a straight face, a strong face, and you're on the site and you're trying to keep things happy and trying to keep the clients happy and trying to keep the workflow moving. But then people have their demons, you know what I mean? And they just, you know, and they bring them to work and it, it's just, there's gotta be, I guess, a, a line drawn at that point saying I can help you and I can listen and I can maybe even suggest certain things, but I can't fully absorb you uh, cause it will affect my life. Yeah. And I think that the, the your original question, um, <clears throat> I think that that, that point, like if you're, you lay it out like this is what we do because as an employer, I think you need to be sensitive to what yes. your people are going through and you need to understand, but it needs to be a two way street. Yes. They also, they can't just come and puke everything on you. So you need to have that conversation. I am here for you. And if you need my time, we can make an, like we can make some time for that, but it can't be every day all the time. And it really does come to, it comes down to like, um, a bit of tough love when it, if it spreads onto your job sites, like it never impacted his work or the work environment until he sent that one text. Yeah. Um, and until then, I think that when it starts, you can't have that thing, that kind of thing spread. Like if it is going like the other employee that we had, how we, this is how we dealt with people that um, didn't work out. Like the other one that we had that just wore his heart on his sleeve and was never happy about anything. It was what we called kind of a cancer. Um, we found a different employer for him. We made a few phone calls because he was incredibly smart. He was incredibly technically incredible. That's why we really took advantage of the knowledge that he had. But when it got to the point where it was starting to spread, 
we made a phone call and found a different employer for him that was close to his home. So he never had a long commute anymore because that was part of the issue. Like, what is the issue and how can you gracefully um, let them go? Because I, like, there were very few employees that I was happy to let go. Most of the time, what we did was found somewhere else for them to go. Okay. You're not a good fit here. And we would make some phone calls because we had a lot of people in the industry that we knew. We have this guy and there was one guy that was a commercial guy that would take anybody that he could, you know, and get them to do anything. So we would just give him the option. Like, it's not working out here for this and that reason. We wouldn't make it personal. And here's a number for somebody that you can call who's looking for people and you can go work there if need be. And that, at that point, it's up to them. If they want to make the phone call, go ahead. If you don't want to make the phone call, that's okay too. It was kind of a way for me to not feel guilty about letting people go because I never liked doing it. But at the same time, you know, some people that aren't a good fit, you need to you need to let them go. You can't let that cancer spread throughout your whole organization. It will bring everything down. So hire on your values and let people go who don't fit. I agree with you. And and on the flip side, when everything is great. And new trades, people that meet each other for the very first time or work with each other for the very first time and they get it along really well and they're joking around and they're having a good time. Mm-hmm. You can see that environment on the job site. You can see how everybody is really challenged and wanting to help and they'll actually help each other. And you'll see things that you don't normally see, like a double rainbow. You'll see electricians helping plumbers and plumbers helping electricians, you know, stuff like that. So I yes. love those vibes, right? But you're right. Like when you get that negative, that one person it just goes across the entire crew and then it affects everything. Yeah, it does. And I, you need to, like, like I said, if you can hire from the beginning based and be, you know, have that awareness again, awareness um, to hire because there's so much desperation. There's so much desperation in needing people. And if somebody is willing to come work for you, you're just like, Oh, but he's willing to come and he's got the skill set that I need. But think about the impact that it's going to have across your whole organization it's only going to be, it's only going to cost you money and it's going to be more difficult. Get the emotional part out of it. Stick yes. to the facts. Yeah, you if have it doesn't to. fit, it doesn't fit. You have to, which actually is interesting because it brings up to the, to the Green Book talk, which is basically workplace violence and harassment. Uh, and I mean, that's something that is part of our industry. It's part of every in- industry. It's there and there's ways of handling it. So employers must assess their workplace for risks of violence and harassment. They may arise from the conditions, workplace and work. Employers must inform the committee health and safety representative of the results in writing and inform the workers giving a written copy if requested. Employers must prepare a policy with respect to workplace violence and harassment and review that policy at least annually. Uh, the policy must be place uh, where everyone can see it unless the company employs five or more then it becomes a different thing employers must prepare a program to implement the policy including measures to control risks uh, measures for for summoning immediate assistance (laughs) measures for workers to report and have that dialogue and an outline of how the employer will deal with these incidences so Mm -hmm. this happens across the board It, it it's not just construction we're not special that way uh it happens everywhere so but it's just as an employer you have to be prepared for it uh if it does come up yeah i think for us like we had an employee handbook policies procedures all written out and it very much in depth went through harassment violence all of those things that um you know were not tolerated zero tolerance and we had a process in place for exactly that making sure mind you we didn't do like we didn't have them posted but we were bigger than five people um but everybody had a handbook and it was something that we went through like we didn't go through the whole handbook but things like that we did and you know writing people up um having written stuff in their file if there were any issues Uh, we may have written one person up once like it was, but we didn't employ any females either. And no guys said anything. Like we didn't employ females in the field. Yeah. Just, to, you know, that we just didn't have any opportunity to, but um, I think that those are really important points for sure. Yeah. Um, this has been a great conversation. I think we tackled quite a bit and shared quite a bit. And I'm always encouraging the younger tradespeople to uh, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't worry. I mean, well, I won't. I can't speak for everybody else, but I won't bite back and I won't say it's, that was a stupid question. I won't do any of that. I'll encourage anybody to ask anything because guess what? I'm always asking. I'm not the smartest person in the room. I never will be. Um, so, I mean, I'm just uh, before we get to the 12 questions, Corley, I'm just wondering, is there anything else that you want to touch upon? No, I think that was good. Yeah. That was, um, good. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And, and it's been fun and finally meeting and talking. Uh, so let's tackle the 12 questions here. You ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> 
Uh, you have a cheat sheet there? Do you have a cheat sheet? Yes, I do. Oh, you do have a cheat sheet. <laughs> Don't worry. There's cheating allowed on TCL. Uh, good. What is your favorite construction word? Yes. Nice. Yes, it can be done. What is your least favorite construction word? Can't. What turns you on in construction? The smell of fresh cut lumber. Uh, I was, it's intoxicating to me. Yes. I worked at Home Depot actually when I was younger, um, when I was in school. And um, I used to work in the lumber and building materials department. And I would spend like all day Saturday in the saw aisle. Cutting <laughs> lumber. I love it. Love it. What turns you off in construction? Um, I think the small minds that give us a bad reputation. Yes. I, it's, it's unfortunate. What's your favorite curse word? I'm not a big cursor. If you're but not I a cursor, you, you don't have to curse. I'm letting people pass on no, that a one. a well-placed F-bomb. Okay. A well is like, it's a, such a release when you get like that frustration. <laughs> yeah. Planet, planet accordingly. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> what is your favorite vehicle? Um, the Triton Model H. It's an electric vehicle that's in prototype right now. <clears throat> I think I know which one you're talking about. It looks like a Suburban, but yes. really sleek lines. Yes, I think and it's, yeah. It's electric. Okay. It's beautiful. I want one. <laughs> Are they all in the market or when they planning for that to be on no. the market? They were planning on producing them, I think back in 2000, like 19 or 20. So I've had my eye on it for a long time. I'm like, hello. <laughs> so yes. What is your least favorite vehicle? <laughs> I, I'm not going to say the particular um, model, but we had a work van that was I hated, I hated it. It was relatively new. Like we bought it new, but it was relatively new on the market and it broke down all the time. And the brakes, there was like $2,000 to get the brakes. As, a, as a new not, vehicle, this was a new, yes. a new vehicle. Yes. I was just like, this is ridiculous. I hated that thing. Tell me after the it. show, tell me after the show, which one it is. So I know it. I will. <laughs> what construction sound or noise do you love? Uh, cutting lumber. Maybe it's because of the smell that accompanies yes. it. I'm not sure. Especially summer. Something about summer and uh, that smell. Yes. Yeah. What uh, construction center noise do you hate? A compressor. Like, I don't know why they can't, like, put a muffler in those things. They're so there loud. are There are some mufflers. I have a, Oh, are I have there? A, and actually, it, I would say it dampens maybe 50% of it. Uh, yeah, it does. They are there. They're there. Hate it. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? You know, it's interesting because when I thought profession, I thought what other profession in the construction industry? Oh, anything. And anything. I thought it could be anything. But the reality is like I would, if I had, if I could go back a carpenter, like that's what I should have been. That's what I should have been. But it goes back to when I was coming out of high school. I loved construction my whole life, but girls going into, like it just wasn't even a thing that, point, that yeah. was considered. Uh, yeah. What profession would you not like to do? Drywall ever i did it once when we did renovations on our old house yes and i'm like oh this looks really good and then i painted it and i'm like i'm never doing this again <laughs> it was so bad and it was like the dust i don't know it is a serious skill and i admire the people who do it well it, it is. is serious it is um if heaven exists what would you like to hear god say when you arrive at those pearly gates well done that's all i do have one last question to ask you Yes. I don't know if you've got an answer because it's a very difficult question, but how do we get more tradeswomen into this industry? How do we encourage them or how do we open up the gate? I don't know. Like, I, I really don't know how we do that. I think there's a lot of people who are very passionate about it, who are doing really good things to encourage that. I don't think there's any short answers. No. Like there's none that is going to like open the floodgates and all of a sudden, but I think it's, it's the constant work that a lot of people are doing, like just promoting and getting out there. And I think it starts early. Like, I think, you know, we need to get into elementary schools and yes. show the girls what they're capable of, like yes. not in high school, high school, they already have their opinions. It's too like late. when they're still like somewhere between six and nine years old and they can get their hands on real tools and actually see themselves doing the things because they see people like them doing it. I think that that's where the value lies. It's going to be the long investment and it's going to be, um, you know, we need to realize that it, there's not an overnight fix, but I think there's a lot of people putting a lot of attention on it right now that makes me hopeful that in the next say 10 years, we see a lot more change than we did in the last 30. Cause I, I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I'm, I do. I'm I do love seeing the trades daddies out there. 
and they're with their little girls and they're mm. working away at home and and you can see the interest and the passion coming from their daughters and i'm like i love seeing those posts i totally i i'll always stop and take a peek and i'll always comment and leave a comment like i love seeing those ones so I, i'm very hopeful that you're, you're, you're right that it's not just a one or two percent increment i th- i'd love to see like a 10 percent increment mm. and, and just yeah. keeps on increase I, i'd love to see canada be a leader in this that would, that would be, be nice. All right. Thank you very much. So everyone, again, Thrive HQ, Coralie, and it's www.thrivehq.ca, and it's Coralie at thrivehq.ca, and on Instagram is Coralie Beattie, and also on LinkedIn, also on Facebook, and reach out to her. Speak to her. You're not, she won't, you, you won't be afraid of her. Trust me, I guarantee you, you won't be afraid of her, and she'll actually help you. I'm here to help. help. I, will, help I really you. want to support anybody I can. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks. I think we're out of here, Angelina. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I totally forgot to mention Coralie's book. So you can find her book at uh, www.thrivehq.ca forward slash hiring hyphenated secrets. Uh, please check it out. Uh, it's I, I want to pick up a copy. I want to check it out. She actually had it on the mantle. Uh, so please check out the book. It's Hiring Secrets for Trades and Construction, The Ultimate Guide to Finding, Hiring, and Retaining Top Talent. Something that we all have to um, get better at. That's it.